testing, testing. Just talk on your end for a second. Sure. Let's talk away. It I love your good. sign. That that sign must be wall monkeys. Wall monkeys, of course. Ah, <laughs> We'll give. I'll, I'll mention Jason because I have to give him credit for the questions that he came up with. I sure. can't take credit for it. So he's a great guy. All right, let's rock it. Let's do it. All right, Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm especially excited to have the founder of Mastermind Talks, Jason Gaynard. Several people I've interviewed have raved about you and how amazing your events are. Every time I talk to them, they, your name comes up over and over. So I had to have you on, Jason. Mastermind, for anyone who doesn't know, Mastermind Talks is an annual invite-only event. It's designed for elite entrepreneurs. They have top entrepreneurs who both speak and all the attendees are elite entrepreneurs also. The event you know, features people such as Tim Ferriss, Mark Echo, many more. He started Mastermind Talks after building up Tickets Canada to $6 million in revenue. In the end, left him a quarter million dollars in debt. Jason, thank you so much for joining me. Dude, I'm excited. I didn't know you were a doctor, so I feel even more privileged to (laughs) to, to be interviewed by you. (laughs) You're welcome. And it's a pleasure. And you know what? All the I did a lot of research and a lot of the podcasts I see, they highlight this quarter million dollars in debt. So I felt like I had to ask, I will ask about it, but I really want to focus about mastermind talks and how you built that up and how, you know, people just keep raving about it. And I always like to start about a fun fact and a fun fact that most people don't know is tell people what you're training for. So every year I try to do something that's far outside my comfort zone that I believe to some degree is impossible because I feel like if you are able to attain something you thought was impossible, it challenges all your beliefs in all areas of your life. Yeah. Uh, so next year I have booked uh, in August of next year a 160-kilometer race and a basically 12 to 14 hour um, Navy SEAL style kind of training um, in Encinitas. So both of those, anybody who knows me, I mean, I'm fairly physically fit, nowhere near physically fit to either run 160 kilometers or do any kind of Navy SEAL training. But uh, those dates are my calendar. So they're they're real, they're scheduled. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make it happen. So what's a Navy SEAL? What do you have to do? Uh, What's well, funny? Do you know Ben Greenfield? Yes. Yeah. I so, did interview him also. Yeah. So Ben Greenfield. He is intense. Dude, he's an amazing dude. And he won actually he won our last Mastermind Talks event as oh, a speaker. Wow. Yeah, he's f- actually a phenomenal speaker. He blew me away. But uh, Ben actually just came back. It's been on my bucket list for quite some time to do this this thing. It's called Kokoro Camp. Okay. And it's put on by this guy named Mark Devine, who's a former Navy SEAL. He was Navy SEAL for 20 plus years, top of his class. And I've always been fascinated with... Uh, like stress inoculation in the sense that like you push yourself to do things that are difficult when you have a customer who doesn't pay you or something like that. It's not that big of a deal because you've been through far worse, right? So right. always kind of pushing yourself in that sense. Yeah. So I wanted to, I, I aspire to do a Kokoro camp one day, which is basically a Navy SEAL hell week condensed into 50 hours. Wow. Um, but Ben Greenfield just did it a few weeks ago and did a blog post about it. And I was reading about it today. I'm like, that, it was brutal. Like if you read this, it was just. What was the craziest thing that would deter you or, or someone from doing it? Well, it's, it's, <laughs> I don't know. Like they, it's basically 50 hours of, of torture, like without a doubt, like torture, like by the sea, they make you like pretend you're drowning in a group. So like it's, it's, oh, wow. it's absolutely bananas. So there's a lighter version for people like me, which is like 12 to 14 I'm hours. I'm sure it's so still pretty difficult. It's still going to be extremely yeah. difficult, but, uh, nonetheless. Yeah. So Ben, Ben Greenfield's a rock star. He did it, uh, all smiles, but, um, yeah, it pushed him harder than he's yeah. ever been. If pushed he said it. it's hard, I would just <laughs> go to I know. S- I would forget about it. <laughs> I know, exactly. Yeah. So, no, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Maybe I'll loop back with you after I do it. So, when did you start this, Jason? When did you start doing these out of your comfort zone uh, events? Uh, I mean, I've always done it to some level um i've always known that kind of growth happens at the end of your comfort zone to a degree so you know if i look back um you know i always surrounded myself with people who are one or two steps ahead i always kind of looked at people who are far ahead of me and one of the core reasons for that is you know i said surround myself with people who constantly make me feel uncomfortable because what that does unconsciously it forces you to bridge that gap between where you are and where they are as quickly as possible because we all have a desire or a need to feel like we're accepted in a group setting uh, or we belong to a tribe to a degree so that's kind of been a common theme throughout my life is is kind of pushing myself now much more conscious of it where 
like for example, I'm terrified of heights. Absolutely brutal has been a huge fear of mine for quite some time. I went skydiving last year. Wow. Like it, I'm trying to go like to the opposite extreme again because then you realize, you know, you can do things you didn't think you could do. And it really, again, it makes you rethink like all, we all have limiting beliefs and, and mm-hmm. stuff that keeps us from doing things and stuff like that. And uh, for me, just really pushing yourself outside your comfort zone and and and, and that kind of stuff has is, is just been huge. And mm-hmm. I mean, Warren, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger have this thing where every year they focus on removing one area where they're ignorant in <laughs> so even on a professional level so i do that from a beliefs perspective but even mm-hmm. on a professional level like this year for me is my finances as far as being very vigilant as far as how i track finances and that kind of stuff because i've always been great at making money but it was like pouring money in a strain or sorry pouring water in a strainer just come out the back end because i was never mm-hmm. financially responsible to a degree so um so yeah that's that's kind well, of so what is one of those examples of the i know we'll get to a little bit but the uh pouring money in the strainer uh well i just i've never i've been i guess i was lucky to a to a degree in my first business where i made more money than i could spend it <laughs> so uh it's a good that, problem it was a good problem yeah but i've never been i've always associated pain to numbers to a degree i dropped out of high school with grade 10 math because i I could not pass math. Like I could not wrap my head around algebra. I could not see the the real world value of some of the stuff they taught in school. So I always associated pain to to money, and or it's not pain to to numbers. Mm. And uh, was always good at making money. And and with our first business, we grew to about six million dollars a year over four years with no outside investment. Yeah. So that that was That's great. great. Yeah. Uh, but the at the end of the day like the finances and stuff like that it was just it was never it was just a bit of a nightmare uh, like if you could ask me like what was your balance sheet the last month i will i have no i didn't even know what a balance sheet was up until a couple of weeks ago and i've been yeah. an entrepreneur for 11 years yeah. so uh and that's actually a problem i know a lot of entrepreneurs have who are very much like me or kind of like you're just go. doing it you're just exactly go go yeah. go so behind every great entrepreneur is usually a great coo right who really does take care of the fi- like tracks the finances yeah. and tracks the the inner workings of the business because yeah. a lot of entrepreneurs like me are great uh, if you do a colby test we're great at uh, quick start that's what they label us as like i'm a nine out of ten as far as a quick start so mm-hmm. great at starting things terrible at follow through right that's the majority of entrepreneurs so we focus on things that are are shiny and and urgent and those kind of things right. when really we we need to be focusing on, on uh, some of the stuff like finances and stuff like that yeah. so it's easy to get rich and i've been rich uh, but it's it's hard to be wealthy and have that kind of going ongoing, yeah. and that's really my focus right now. Is you know I'm building things much slower, but I'm I have my my finger on everything right now. Yeah. Um, but like I said, I mean again, behind every great entrepreneur is a great COO. Uh, oftentimes, yeah. you know, that's a good so. distinction. Yeah, rich versus wealthy. So how do you compensate for that now? Now that you know this, how do you compensate for? getting that great CEO or that person behind to to pick up the slack where you are not your you know not an expert sure well i mean so i know in any area of my life or any area in general um, you know success leaves clues so if i'm not good with finances i surround myself with people who are great with finances mm-hmm. um, again so i'll bridge that gap so i may not be a rock star at finances in the next couple of years but i'll at least be very proficient um, and, uh, so right now that was my focus for the year. So I have two mentors who are just phenomenal when mm-hmm. it comes to, uh, to finances and stuff like that. Like they're to the extreme, like they live on very, like very, uh, small means to a degree, like on a monthly basis. Yeah. And they have like a bajillion dollars in the bank, which is like actual cash. So, um, these are guys i don't want to live my life to that extreme but surrounding myself with these type of people i'm going to pick up a lot of stuff through osmosis as to how to look at money how to look at wealth and stuff like that so uh, that's a big focus of mine for the next for the next year so what's some of the great advice they've given you so far oh god i mean it's nothing it's not so a lot of it's not stuff i didn't know per se um it just it's really sitting down and doing it and paying attention yeah. to everything it's it's like one of the major benefits i have now is is one of them is a close friend of mine or has become a close friend of mine because of all this and uh is kind of like an accountability partner we hold a call every every friday mm-hmm. and i know it's like building a habit right once you do the first yes. Once you do the first like couple weeks or whatever, then you actually start getting interested and into it. Um, and for me, like I would, I 
you know, I'd be like, okay, I'm tracking my finances now and I do it for a little bit and then I'd lose interest and I didn't see value in it, but now I'm really kind of obsessed. I live and die by the numbers. Um, and again, it's because I surround myself with people who also live and die by the numbers. And also I have that accountability because they're people I respect. And if they're going to give me their time, you know, for free in essence, I want to be very respectful of, of their time. And if they tell me to do something or I need to track something, the next phone call I have with them, uh, I better follow through with that because that relationship's going to end pretty quick if I don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the things I love about, I was researching one of the things I looked at is your LinkedIn profile. And under the education, you list all these different groups and masterminds that you were in. Tim Ferriss Kimono Group, Tony Robbins Day with Destiny. And obviously this fits perfectly with the mastermind talks. But I wanted to find out first some of the things you learned from the Tim Ferriss Kimono Group and what was most memorable from that event. Sure. Well, and unfortunately that list is incredibly outdated <laughs> because in the sense that I spend 50 to $60,000 a year on learning, I'm always going to events. I'm yeah. always participating masterminds and stuff like that. So I think that list only has like three or four things, but, um, Tim Ferriss's event. I mean, I'm glad you picked that one. Cause that probably was one of the most impactful events, uh, in my life. And the reason for that, and that's actually how mastermind talks came to be for the most part. Oh, really? And the reason for that was because that event, uh, it was three years ago and it was geared towards authors. I never had the intention of ever becoming an author, but it was $10,000 to go for two days. And I'm like, at $10,000, there's a good chance there'll be some interesting people there. And that's the most I ever spent on an event by far, at least 10 times more than I've ever spent. And people in my network at the time are like, you're crazy spending this kind of money. You'll never see the ROI. But I'm like, you know what? I just have this kind of strong gut intuition feeling that I should go. Mm -hmm. So thankfully, I applied. I got accepted, went down to the event. And that event completely changed how I view and value being surrounded by brilliant people. Um, you know, there, our slogan for our first mastermind talks event was if you're the smartest person in the room, yes. you're in the wrong room. Yes. And that room, I would definitely, I don't know how I got in there, but, uh, it's, uh, you know, what happened at that event was, was great. I mean, the content was great and that kind of stuff, but it was intimate event. And if you look at mastermind talks again, it, it's kind of modeled after that event to a degree. There's a lot of things about that event that made it unique that I adopted for mastermind talks, but it was about 130, I was 130 people in the room. Um, majority are best-selling authors. Um, and we didn't do like, I didn't make a lot of connections at the event. I'm not a good networker face to face. Oddly enough, I'm getting much better at it, but, um, I'm great. I would never guess that. I know it's so funny because I went to, you know, Yannick, I'm assuming you know Yannick Silver. Uh -huh. So I went to one of his Maverick events when one of the people in my mastermind group came to this Maverick event as well. And uh, actually it was the underground. That's what it was. And there was this networking evening thing. And we went in, we walked in and we were there for two, three minutes. And she's like, I thought you were like a, a masterful like networker. She's like, you're standing or like around the corner and stuff like that. I'm like, that's actually, that's what I do. You know, I actually sit back and observe the room. That's exactly what I do too. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Actually, it's actually incredibly effective if yeah. you do it right because if it, it the value is in, in the follow-up because there's so much noise that happens in a networking event it's all superficial like what do you do or that kind of stuff so i'll identify people and then I, it's easy to find out people's email addresses or get connected to somebody and i'll reach out to them afterwards and be like hey i saw you at this event we brushed by each other didn't have a chance to connect you know this is what I love what you're up to or whatever the case may be. And I'd love to connect for 15 minutes. And then I'll actually have a one-on-one -on -one phone call with them afterwards and build a much stronger relationship than I would otherwise. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, anyways, I don't know how we got on that tangent, but so the kimono event completely was a game changer for me. Uh, and the beautiful thing about that event, because the people who said, Oh, you'll never see the ROI on the event after the event happened. Um, I didn't see the ROI you know, right away per se. Um, but I just, I, again, I saw a huge value in the event. And if you look at mastermind talks, so the mastermind talks took place about two and a half years later, never thought I'd be in the event space, but people never invest in their relationships because they can never peg, uh, an, a, you know, a financial figure to the ROI. Like, you know, if I become friends with Tim Ferriss, what is that going to mean for my business? Right. right? Um, and you shouldn't necessarily, you know, look at relationships Think that, that way, way either. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, but if you look at Mastermind Talks, the first Mastermind Talks event we had two years later, uh, five of the speakers who spoke on our stage for free were from that event three years or two years prior. Really? Uh, we had about six people in the audience who paid $3,000 to be at Mastermind Talks from that same event two years prior. And I had two people who signed up for my Mastermind Group at $40,000 a year, sorry, $20,000 a year. So if you tally up all the lost, potentially lost revenue, because if I didn't know these people and the speaker fees, I would have had to pay these speakers to come speak. Right. Uh, it comes up to something like $240,000 I would have had to spend. 
Um, so the ROI, you know, from a ten thousand dollar event gave me a two hundred forty thousand dollar ROI over two and a half years, which is incredible. But the beautiful thing is, these are relationships. Like these. I mean, the ROI is going to be in the millions, you know, as long as I live yeah. to my 80s. And I'm I'm close friends with a lot of these people. Right. I'm going to Ryan Holiday's wedding in February. You know what I mean? And that's how I met him at that event. So, uh, yeah. So that when people always ask me, like, you know, they're they're not too excited about building a network or they're trying to, again, think of it from that perspective. It, that's for me is like a wonderful example of the potential ROI if you, you know, take advantage of really focusing on relationships. Yeah, so what was it in your gut that made you go to that event? Because I'm sure a lot of other people maybe felt something and didn't act. Well, there's a lot. And I, know, I know there's a lot of people who didn't act. Um, I know there's a lot because we have some of them who come to Mastermind Talks who are like, I, I know you went to that event. And I saw that event. I was going to pull the trigger, but I didn't. Right. Um, and, you know, life rewards those who take action. That's That's really all I can say. I just had a strong gut feeling that I should go. And it's in hindsight, like, you know, I, it makes no sense why I was there. Like I, there was a lot of people in the information marketing space. There was a lot of best selling authors. I was, a, you know, in transition out of a ticketing business and I had no clue what I was going to do next. I was in transition at the time. Um, and no, I, I didn't even know about information marketing. That's the one thing that event did for me as well was it really blew my mind as far as what was possible in business. Cause there was guys there like Ryan Dice and Evan Pagan. And I was talking to these guys and I remember Jeff Walker was there as well and he stood up and he's like, I've helped entrepreneurs. I've never told this story before, but he's like, he stepped up and we were all doing our introductions and he stepped up and he's like, I've helped entrepreneurs do half a billion dollars in product launches. And I'm like, BS, like there's no way or whatever, like this guy's going to get laughed out of here. And then, you know, I, you pay attention to Jeff Walker's stuff. Like he's legit or Evan Pagan was talking from the stage. He does $30 million a year in eBooks and stuff like that around dating. And I'm like, blows my mind because like my traditional model of business was that you had, you had an actual physical product or service you sold online but that was pretty much the extent of it so yeah. to see these people create value from nothing was was mind-blowing for me so it definitely yeah it was, it was well worthwhile as far as the investment is concerned uh originally and i know there were a lot of people who didn't uh didn't take the the, the plunge on it but uh, like I said, life rewards those who take action. So yeah, and I want to talk about mastermind talks, but I want to also you again, like you probably, like you said, go to dozens and dozens of seminars, spend tons of money on personal development, but you put Tim Ferriss Kimono Group, and you also put Tony Robbins Date with Destiny. So mm. I figured those were very important for you. So what was what did you learn from that? What was memorable? In regards to Tony Robbins, yeah, and I saw the video of your um, your child. You made say yes, 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 and there were a few comments saying, "Oh, really? Take him to Tony <laughs> Robbins." Yeah, so that's uh, so yeah. So Tony Robbins, I've been uh, I've been following him to, to some degree for the past four years, perhaps. I mean, that's the first kind of step I ever took into the whole personal development realm, and uh, yeah, I mean, I've. I participated in his UPWs, his Unleash the Power Within events. I've listened to his tapes um, and that kind of stuff. I'm a huge fan of what he does and what he stands for. And uh, there's only one Tony Robbins. That's the thing. So I try to immer I try to go to as many events as I can. So maybe one a year to kind of stay on top of things mm -hmm. and stay refreshed. But um, he's not going to be in this game for for that much longer. Once he's gone, it's going to be you know audiobooks and audio tapes and stuff like that. So I, I mean, what breakthroughs I, did you have? What was one breakthrough you had from one of his teachings or seminars? Because I hear going is it's nothing like it. Oh, no. I mean, he is by far, you know, the greatest speaker in the world and the greatest. I mean, it just it, to be in that environment uh, is absolutely incredible. I mean, to, to, uh, for a man to be on stage for Date with Destiny, for example, he's on stage for five of the six days for 14 to 16 hours, like ridiculous. I mean, you, you wonder why the guy's losing his voice. He's up there screaming and, and stuff like that. Like he's, he's amazing at what he does as far as takeaways. I mean, it's, it's so hard cause it's, he, he was, he was just the person who put me on that path of awareness and questioning everything I do as far as like my behaviors and stuff like that. I mean, that to me, I think awareness is under underrated and underappreciated. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, out of everything, I've never thought about it, but I really, you know, owe my, my life to him to a degree, uh, because his teachings have been, and his teachings are not like all original per se. He's just kind of taking the best, the best of NLP yeah. and, and this and that, and has made it practical. It's yeah. practical psych psychology yeah. to a degree. So uh, I may not have a psychology degree or anything like that, but I can hear through him. And he just, you know, his model is condensed decades into days. And then you go to one of his events, and it's 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 really yeah. amazing. 
I was just thinking maybe he like brought you on stage and you had this crying moment or something. No, 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 no. Because yeah, I mean, I it's it's so weird. The first couple ones I did, like it's an uncomfortable setting because they want you to get in state. So there's dancing around and there's massaging the person next to you and all that kind of stuff. And I always have these voices in my head be like, this is stupid. This is ridiculous. Don't do this. You look like a fool. So it took me a while to probably get into it, into it. And I'm still not 100% in right. uh, to a degree. But again, I definitely I definitely love his work. And uh, he's, he's definitely amazing at what he does. So, you know, that brings me to Mastermind Talks. And so tell me the transition to you starting Mastermind Talks. And I want to hear a little bit about the first year compared to the second. Sure. Uh, so I can go through my story really quick. So yeah. like I kind of touched on, I dropped out of high school. I started a service-based business out of high school. Uh, and I realized a service-based business. So what business. made you drop out of high school? Well, thankfully, I had parents who were not super strict about education because <laughs> my father was not an academic. Mm. My mother wasn't necessarily an academic either. So that's the one thing I'm, I look back and I'm grateful for is that they weren't like – What did they know, say when you go, I'm going to drop out? There was not much to say about it. I mean my father is, is very much like he he's a construction worker, so he works by the hour. So the sooner I could get into the working Start world work. work, working by the hour, then that to him that was success because he literally had like grade eight education or something like that. So yeah. um, so that was kind of his model. My wife my, – my wife, my mother didn't, mo- um, not, like, didn't mind all that much. And it was one of those things like I was already working. Throughout high school, I was working 30, 40 hours a week in a full-time job just on evenings and weekends. So I'd, yeah. I'd leave school and get to work at five o'clock at night and I'd finish around midnight and then yeah. get to school the morning. I'd, I'd sometimes miss two, three weeks of school because I was working. And yeah. I'd come back to school and they're like, you know, they, they give me heck. And I'm like, I'm making more money than you, the teacher. You know what I mean? So right. why are you so much hell? So, uh, so yeah, school just was not for yeah. me. I'm not, I'm very, I, I love learning through osmosis and seeing people yeah. like really apply things. And I'm very, um, like I use, a, you know, a kinesthetic, I guess you could say, uh, sitting down very hands and, and on very yeah. much. So I can't do anything I don't like. I can't listen to anything I don't like. Yeah. Like I have to find a natural interest or, or something and I'll be the best in the world at it. But if I don't have an interest, I just yeah. zone out. So yeah. I want to um, ask about that because I think it's interesting also because you have a daughter and she's going to be going to high school. And so what it, when she asks or what, what are your philosophies? I know entrepreneurs think a little bit differently with education and college and the worth of it what are your thoughts on that or when when she brings that up to you what will you what will you tell her i will be surprised if she there's still colleges and universities by the time she comes around uh just because of emerging technologies and stuff like that but it's funny it is a very very hot button for entrepreneurs we have a, a private facebook group for mastermind talks for our alumni and we have three major discussions in there right now with like 40 50 comments each around homeschooling and alternatives on how to also teach entrepreneurship to kids uh, without like forcing it down their throat type of things because i know cameron harold was a speaker and he gave a ted talk a big ted talk about you know raising kids as entrepreneurs yeah so it's it's very much a hot button Uh, for us i mean my daughter's two and a half right now Mm. um i think one of the biggest things is it's not necessarily i'm I would never want to outsource my child's education to the government. I mean, I think they they screw up enough things to outsource her to just become part of this like puppy mill is not my style. I think a lot of the the uh, responsibility lies on the shoulders of the parents. Um, and uh, in my case, I mean, nothing has forced me to grow more than having a daughter, without a doubt. Right. Um, and uh, so that's been a huge personal growth push for me ever since she's been born is because there's a saying that um, do you have kids by by chance or two yeah. kids. Yeah. Do you have a daughter? One, two daughters. Oh, yes. killer. Okay, so one's three, so they're about the same age. So there's yeah. uh, well, somebody. I think it was my wife who told me. She's like, you know, there's a saying that the first person, the first man a you know, girl falls in love with, or your daughter is is their their father to a degree, right? Like right. that becomes that that example as to what they'll accept from a man, or or those kind of things. And I'm like that. Mm-hmm. That put a ton of weight off my back. Oh my god! I'm like, really? I'm like, I really have to step up my game. (laughs) Um, So that uh, that was a big thing. So for us, as of right now, we're playing things by ear. But uh, yeah, I mean, I want to hold you to it. But in in 15 years, I'm going to play this back. We'll see what happens. Sure. No, I mean, I think we're we're definitely leaning towards homeschooling. We're definitely not putting it into traditional schooling. That's not high school. So you think you'll homeschool? 
Well, homeschool for the first little bit and see how it goes. Mm-hmm. I never like as an entrepreneur, you never speak in absolutes because right. you never know. But <laughs> it depends, as, right. exactly. But in the case of like her, definitely homeschooling for the first little bit, unless we found a really like rock star school. There's a ton of alter, uh, like uh, alternative schools out, out there that are really you know all about like finding what they're unique at or what they're great at or what they're passionate about and mm-hmm. really running with it. Mm-hmm. And I'm totally cool with that method. I'm not like you know homeschooling is the only way by any stretch. But I know traditional schooling. At least in Canada, it's not terrible, terrible, but I definitely, you know, my my daughter's my everything, so I'm gonna yeah. give the upper hand uh, whenever possible. Do so. people? Are there two big sides? Is it like in the forums? Is it just everyone's for the non-traditional route? Because obviously, there's a socialization aspect, which you know, with sure. homeschool. Do you find it's divided, or is it pretty much? Well, not in our community. All our community is like I'm homeschooling, or I'm doing some. We're sending her to, you know. Montessori, whatever the case may be, like they're all like they, they know traditional is not the the way to mm-hmm. a degree, mm-hmm. just based on their own kind of personal experiences. So yeah. uh, that's pretty. So it's not necessarily a great debate between traditional and homeschooling. It's pretty much what's the best method of homeschooling, uh, because that's it's pretty much. I mean, there's people in the group who have. I mean, there's one friend of mine I know who he works from home. He has five kids, and they homeschool. Wow. So I'm like, that's a school in itself. You know what I mean? So. Uh, he's a, he's a bit of a trooper. So, um, yeah, I mean, the debate is, is pretty much, yeah. you know, what's the best we can offer our, our children yeah. and, um, you know, as far as education, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And that whole socialization aspect, it matters, but it's funny. Like, I, again, like if you speak to oftentimes anybody who's been homeschooled, like if, I know a girl who's 16 and she's like way ahead of her years. Like this girl is just up to all kinds of amazing things. And Ben, Ben Greenfield, I told him to talk about parenting at mastermind talks and people would naturally think he's a triathlete and stuff like that. He wanted to speak about health and fitness. I'm like, dude, you have uh, two he's twin twins. boys oh, yeah. who are six and I've heard nothing but amazing things about these kids. I mean, they're homeschooled. They're going to Thailand and making, learning how to make pad thai. They're tennis pros. They're, you know, they have businesses selling Lego on Craigslist and stuff like that. Like that's the future, right? So his mm-hmm. talk was actually about having, like building superhuman kids. So when that, <laughs> when that talk is done, uh, editing i'll send it to you because it's a fantastic oh, yeah. talk it's yeah. amazing that'll be amazing yeah so there's a it's definitely a huge pain point for a lot of entrepreneurs i've, I've realized that and in my case definitely we're we're i'm firm believer that conventional methods deal conventional results so we're, mm. we're going a little unconventional when it comes to education but the for socialization sure. aspect i think as long as you're conscious about it um you you know you, you can definitely make some great strides in that yeah. direction so anyways, I didn't want to stick on that too long, but I wanted to hear your what sure. you thought about with your daughter and yeah. your past. So you dropped out of high school and then what was next? So I started a, a so I started a, a service based business, which was a concierge business. And um realized that business was hard to scale because I was trading time for money. Uh and I pivoted into a ticketing business because when people thought of the word concierge at the time, they thought of a hotel concierge. And when we thought of a hotel concierge, they thought of concert tickets. So from a positioning perspective, that's what people were naturally coming to us for. How are uh, you getting customers for the concierge? For that, for that, man, it was an uphill battle. I will say that. I mean, I did all kinds of marketing things that fell flat on their face. I hand delivered um, like flyers and like a, a tuxedo. I did like a really? thousand houses and I didn't get a single response. I did all kinds of crazy stuff that didn't really move the needle. It was really word of mouth after a while. And then because we were one of the first uh, players in our industry, especially up in Canada, uh, we were getting some good SEO. And I was also 18 at the time. And because oh, of yeah, my age, you're young. Yeah. Yeah. So because of my age and because of uh, these, uh, this emerging industry, and we were kind of seen as one of the top people, uh, the value perception. Yeah. Um, I was covered a lot by the media, a ton by the media. So that, that helped as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's but, pretty amazing, Jason. So, I mean, as an 18 year old, you were in a tuxedo going door to door. Where did you even think of to do that? Who was your mentor at the time? It's ridiculous. It didn't make any sense. <laughs> I mean, I'm not I, saying it, I'm saying it's like really out of someone's sure. comfort zone. Yeah, I you mean, know. it's it's one of those things. I, I didn't have any real mentors at the time business wise. And if I did, I probably wouldn't have you know, allocated so much bandwidth towards things that wouldn't work from a marketing perspective. I kind of learned the hard way, but the whole tuxedo thing, but it I toughens don't know. you up. It yeah. does. It de- definitely does. But, uh, and you start to value mentors a hell of a lot more once you, you do things the hard way. But, uh, yeah, the whole tuxedo thing was just one of those things. That I just, I, when you thought of whole 
like a concierge, I'm like, they're dressed up. And I was never one. I was went from being a mechanic. Right. That's, to, a, that's a big difference. It's a big jump. Yeah. But it worked out well for the brand because every time I, I somebody saw me, they're like, oh, what do you do? It was like a, a talking point because I was in a tails tuxedo going to like grocery stores and stuff like that. Wow. So that was great. And then when people would you know use our services or something like that, like it looked incredibly professional. So that was kind of like our, our little sticking point yeah. uh, to a degree, which worked out well. But I don't know necessarily how I thought about it originally. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, it definitely worked out well, well for us. So then you transitioned to the ticketing business. I did, yeah. So ticketing became a big part of the business because people just kept on coming back and coming back. And then I was originally married to the idea of the concierge business. And around that time, I actually got my first mentor. And it's funny how it happened because I – there's this guy featured in a national publication in Canada called Profit Magazine and about getting uh, people grants from the government. And I saw his article, so I reached out to him. like, hey, I'm a young guy. There has to be some kind of grants. I'm like, there, there's always grants. I hear all these people getting grants. I'm like, maybe there's some money I can get. And he's like, oh, I don't deal with your industry. Sorry. And that was pretty much the end of his emails. I'm like, all right. The following month, that same magazine did a three-page spread on me. And he ended up seeing the article and he reached out to me. He's like, you know what? Let's do dinner. So we did dinner and he became my first kind of official mentor to a degree. Uh, and at the time I was considering like I had this this ticketing side of the business, which was really growing. And he's like, you should move into that side of the business. But I'm like, oh, I'm really I love the concierge side, which in hindsight, I didn't. And uh, I ended up following through and taking his advice and going the ticketing route. And that's how I grew that business so quickly. So what happened, what, I mean, you said you transitioned from the concierge to ticketing and you were resisting it a little bit. What were some of the big breakthroughs you had once you transitioned to the, the ticket? Um, I mean, I, I think I didn't get my first breakthrough probably till about two years later, maybe, um, because I was just, you know, I was a one man show for the most part and I was just running and, you know, running my business, working in my business. So. Yeah. Uh, I didn't really have time to stop and think. Yeah. But the funny thing was, is I remember when we were originally talking about limiting beliefs, like we were talking before, we were having dinner and I was doing maybe about $10,000 a month in revenues. And he's like, picture a, a, a picture one day you're doing $80,000 a month. I'm like, dude, there's no way. Like I, I told him at the time, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I can picture it or whatever. Yeah. But like emotionally, there's like, I'm like, there's no way. And about two and a half years later, we had our, we were doing about $750,000, $800,000 a month. And I remember looking at our revenue figures and I'm like, it just it hit me because I've seen these revenue figures before, but one month it hit me and I'm like, my God, like three years ago, I could not even fathom doing $80,000 a month. Now we're doing 10 times that. That's um, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a, it was a pretty, and that, and you know, conversely, like now it's just one of those things that it just changes your standards as well. Right. So I got out of the last business, which is doing 6 million. Now my new business is, I don't know, we're doing maybe half a million, 600,000, something, you know, nothing that major or whatever. But my standard is like 6 million. Right. <laughs> I was like, like I got to get back to that as quickly as possible. Right. So uh, I'm yeah. sure once you do the Navy training, you'll get to whatever you want, right? Oh, that's, dude, it's going to make me bulletproof. It's going to make me bulletproof. So what were some of the things you did to get to that level? I mean, obviously, like, you know, thinking that way, originally you can't even see that. So you did certain steps to get to that level. What did you do? Well, I said it from the stage at Mastermind Talks the first year that ignorance and confidence can go a long way when you're an entrepreneur. And I simply, I just made some really gutsy moves um, by stretching myself month over month. And that's why we grew faster than virtually anybody else who we were competing with. Um, what was gutsy? What do you consider gutsy? So going all in month over month. So we buy concert tickets in bulk. So I buy, you know, whatever my credit card limit was. So, you know, if my limit was $20,000, I go $20,000 all in and then not knowing how and have $0 in the bank account, knowing that I'd have to pay off that credit card the following month. Cause I was dealing specifically with, with American express charge cards, uh, for the majority of the business. So, you know, we had a credit limit with them. We put half a million dollars a month on, on charge cards and with American express, like you can, there's no, you have to pay by the due date. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So when you get that statement date, it has to be paid. So uh, we just go all in, and then when we sold tickets on the back end, we use that to pay the credit card. We just kept this kind of cash flowing machine going. Um, so that was it. I mean, like I said, ignorance and confidence could go a long way. If I had a business mentor at the time or a coach, they would have said, "Don't do this. It's crazy. You'll, you know, you're 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 risking too much." We just did it month over month, and that's how we grew so quickly over four years. And thankfully, it didn't bite us in the butt. Unfortunately, till the end, when a few other things happened. But um, yeah, I mean, it was really kind of 
it, it, Tim Ferriss talks about it, like stress versus eustress. And eustress is really kind of stretching yourself and kind of following through. And for me, I've always worked best with my back against the wall. So every time I would really stretch myself, didn't know where the money would come from, I knew unconsciously that I'd find a way. Yeah. Uh, so that was kind of one of the biggest yeah. lessons during that time period. So what happened at the end? Well, uh, so I was living the whole quote unquote four hour work week. I was traveling the world and this is a show. I always say four hour work week and I never mean it to kind of take a shot at Tim. Um, because it's just the whole lifestyle design thing where you, you know, travel the world, make a ton of money. Um, I like what you, you posted something on Facebook about, um, you were, there was overlooking a pool and you said, um, (laughs) you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. What did you say? That was in Napa Valley. I don't know. What a good quote. It's such, it was, it, it was basically, I don't, it's, it's not, I'm not working because, oh, sorry, I don't have, I don't have the, the freedom to work anywhere. I'm working because I have to work or something like that. Something along, because yes. I'm an entrepreneur, I have yes. to work. Just everybody takes those pictures of their laptop at the pool and that kind of stuff. I love that. And, yeah. and I'm like, it's not because, yeah, it's not because you have the freedom to work wherever you want. It's because you have to work everywhere you are to a degree. Right. So yes. that, was, that was the the caption to it. But yeah, so I mean, the whole, I was living my model of success at the time and, um, one thing was, as I just, I became clear that, you know, when you have that time and freedom to do what you want, when you want, wherever you want, you you get to a point where you start asking yourself some difficult questions like, why am I here? Will I be remembered? How many people show up to my funeral? It's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? right? Yeah. And I was just not happy with the answers I was giving myself at the time. And around that same time, I realized I was making 22 times the national average income. And this crept up on me because I didn't track the finances all that that well throughout that process. I just gave the numbers to the accountant and he'd tell me whatever. But then I realized like I was I was making a large sum of money. Right. And if I divided that, that by the national average income, I was making 22 times the national average. And I'm like, to me, it was bothersome because I'm like, I'm not 22 times happier than the average male. I'm not 22 times healthier. Uh, two, two years prior when I was 23, I had kidney complications because of stress in my business. Wow. So I realized that money and happiness scale very differently. So consciously, I decided to sell the business. That's why I told everybody on the outside. Uh, unconsciously, I started to sabotage it. And I started to scale the business downwards. And then I got comfortable with scaling the business downwards. I, was, I removed myself from the business for the most part. I had some, it was also a death by a thousand paper cuts. Like there was a lot of things wrong with the business um, that I never fixed. Like I had bad hires within the company, which were like a cancer. And I hired B players and they hired C players, <laughs> which is uh, a lot of factors. But I was comfortable with landing at zero. And that was going to take about a year. And then halfway through the process, uh, I had two incidents that landed me that were beyond my control for the most part, but they landed me a quarter million dollars in cash debt. Um, and that was August of 2012. So um, how do you get out of that? So that was a fun time. So I basically was left with quarter million dollars of debt. Um, I just got married. I got married that month. I, so August 2012 was when everything fell apart. Mm-hmm. September 1st, I got married. My daughter turned six months wow. on September 1st. Uh, so I had no business, no cash flow. Um, and so what do you tell your wife? I, I, I told her everything. I mean, she, she knew to a degree um, about everything. I, I definitely didn't try to keep things from her. And it was kind of yeah. gradual to a degree, but it, I mean, it was reality. I don't know how else to kind of frame it. I, yeah. I definitely did keep some things to myself. Like I tried to keep like everything was is still together and stuff like mm-hmm. that. But um, you know, the scary part, the scariest part of that process, a lot of people hear the quarter million dollars and like, oh my God, that's a lot of money. And that actually wasn't the worst part. The worst part was, is that like most entrepreneurs, I built my business at the expense of my health. I built the expense, you know, my business at the expense of my relationship and, mm. or relationships. And I knew I had the mental capacity to pull myself out of that debt. But because I built my business at the expense of my health, I was 72 pounds heavier than I am now. So I had no energy. Really? Yeah, so it was like having a Ferrari for a brain, but with no gas in the tank. And that was the scariest part, because I knew getting my health back on track, even though we're bleeding money, you know, we're trying to, we have our monthly expenses and stuff like that, I knew getting my health back on track and my energy was the first thing I had to do. Um, and then from there, I started kind of uh, taking, uh, you know, morning rituals was a huge thing uh, for me, getting back on, on my feet, probably one of the biggest things. Mm-hmm. Um, idea generation, which I learned from James Altucher, and uh, just that progress, daily kind of incremental progress, and then finally got out of it. Yeah. So what then took you to Mastermind Talks? Well, that kind of, so what happened there was, 
in October of that year, so about a couple months later, somebody gave me a ticket to go see Seth Godin in New York. And somebody posted on Facebook, they're a friend of mine, they're like, hey, you know, I have this extra ticket, anybody want to go? And I'm like, I'll go because my wife would never let me pay for this because we have no money. So I'm like, this is a great opportunity. I'm going to go. So my wife said, okay. So I, I, I agreed to the ticket and I went. And I didn't even know what the theme of this workshop was, but I've always been a huge fan of Seth. I've never had the opportunity to actually see him in live uh, at the time. So I'm like, I'm going to I'm gonna make out to it. So the, the theme of his seminar was the connection economy and how there's huge value connecting like-minded individuals. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I'm like, there's no group as disconnected as entrepreneurs because everybody's working on little, own little businesses and that kind of stuff. And it's very isolating. So what I started to do was these things called mastermind dinners, where I'd invite six to eight entrepreneurs out for dinner who didn't know each other with the hopes of them kind of connecting. And the first one I did, I almost canceled two hours prior because I'm like, nobody's going to see value in this. They're going to think I wasted their time. All those fears of like, you know, the fear of the self-talk. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. They built back up. And that's the funny thing. When I was successful in business before, people would, aspiring entrepreneurs would come to me and they'd be like, well, how do you do it? I'm thinking of starting business, but I'm scared. And I'm like, just grow up and do it. It's not not that hard, right? But when I was, you know, a quarter million dollars in debt, I had all those fears again. Plus, I had the, on top of that, I had this expect, people had this expectation of me because I had enough, my network was all filled with people who were already successful in business. And when I lost it all, I'm like, if I don't bounce back to the same level I was before, I'm going to lose all these friends. So I had a lot kind of riding on it in hindsight, but did this, this dinner, didn't know how it would go. I couldn't cancel it because it was only two hours prior. Um, so I ended up going through with it. And that dinner lasted about four and a half hours and the conversation didn't skip a beat. It was absolutely mm -hmm. amazing. And uh, I got clear on a few things that night, one of them being that connecting entrepreneurs was something I wanted to do to some capacity for the rest of my life. And um, not necessarily as a business. I had no way to monetize these dinners at the time. I actually paid for the dinners myself. So they cost me six, $700 a dinner to put on. And people thought I was crazy, uh, but to me, I was seriously considering bankruptcy at the time because I'm like, I, I'm at the bottom of the barrel right now. I have very little credit left on my credit cards. I'm like, the bank could take my car. They could take whatever measly assets I have left, but they can't take my relationships. So mm -hmm. investing in my relationships were the sa safest investment I could make and investing in myself. Yeah. So I kept on doing these dinners and they were, they, they were fantastic. And then- What uh, were some things at the dinner because- <clears throat> You said the conversation flows. Was it just inherent with the people you put in the room or do you do some things to help people open up? Because I could see people just sitting around the table, even if they're really interesting, great people, sure. it's sometimes hard to, to open up. Yeah, I mean, the key is in facilitation yeah. and not having too big of a dinner. So that's where a lot of people make the mistake is they'll have 12, 14 people at a dinner and it's just not conducive to conversation, right? Yeah. So we usually do now, I mean, those dinners back in the day were eight people. Um, so even at eight people, there's a bit of facilitation that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. So for perfect example at that dinner was we had two people who are very much in the tech space sitting across from each other and they were talking about like, oh, this is amazing stuff coming up in tech and all this kind of stuff. And we were all kind of listening mm -hmm. and there was this other guy on the opposite side of the table who was a mover, who owned a moving company. And I'm like, this guy hasn't said a word. So when there was like a little break in their conversation, I brought him into the conversation. I'm like, hey, you know, tell us more about your company or something like that. And the amazing thing was, is he started talking about his company. And then the guys who were from the tech scene were like, they were giving him marketing ideas. They're like, oh, I love your business. I'm like, dude, you guys are tech. This, he's a mover. You know what I mean? So it became clear to me that as entrepreneurs, we all face similar pains, no matter what industry we're in, raising mm -hmm. capital, managing employees, that kind of stuff. Um, so there's some facilitation that has to take place yeah. in, in the dinner to some degree if you feel like you know conversation is kind of lacking but if you keep it more intimate there there's nowhere for people to hide right to a degree so if you're right. we, normally we do our dinners like six people max so five people uh is my kind of sweet sweet spot number and you know you they're not just going to sit there quietly mm -hmm. all night but it's easy for them to kind of hide in corner if there's 12 people at the dinner table mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so you're doing the the uh the dinners yeah so i was doing the dinners and then um a couple months later, I had an opportunity to do an event with Tim. And how that happened uh, was I used to wake up at four in the morning. Again, morning rituals was a huge thing for me. Woke up at four in the morning. Tim just posted a blog post uh, about this thing he called Land Rush. So he had his book, Four Hour Chef, coming out. Tim is by far one of the best book marketers I know. And what he did was his book was banned from all the Barnes and Nobles 
in the United States. So 1,100 bookstores. So there was a huge hit to him because for him, you know, his first book, New York Times bestseller, second book, New York Times bestseller, the expectation is that the third one's going to be a New York Times bestseller. You can't have a flop after you've had two New York Times bestsellers. So what he did was he created this, this package where if you bought 25 books, you'd get this. If you bought 50 books, you'd do a webinar. If you bought 100 books, you'd do that. And he had this Hail Mary package. If you bought 4,000 books, uh, he'd do two speaking engagements. And at the time, I thought of my uh, good friend of mine up in Canada who puts on these huge entrepreneur events, like two, 3,000 people. I'm like, this is a great opportunity for him because he can easily move the books. And Tim doesn't speak that much. Uh, and he's never spoken in Canada. So I'm like, this is great for him. So I ended up emailing him. And the minute I click send on that email, I'm like, you know what? This is a great opportunity for anybody because, again, Tim doesn't speak that much. He's never spoken to Canada. And it's $84,000. So it's a lot of money. For but sure. you do do have the books that you could try to kind of figure out how you can resell it and stuff like that. Right. I mean, and you're I, a ticket broker. You can resell anything, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'm still stuck with a lot of the books now. But, uh, but and him, I didn't know what his speaker fee was at the time either, right? So I'm like, to me, the worst case scenario was it's cost me $84,000 for two speaking gigs. Is it safe to say that I can take them to two major metropolitan cities and um, – you know, I'll find 42 entrepreneurs to spend $1,000 to spend an hour with him. I'm like, it's pretty likely. Right. So I'm like, that's worst case. So I ended up emailing him directly. I'm like, you know what? I'll take the package. And uh, he replied to me right away. And he's like, I'm off to bed because it was, he, he, was, uh, he was up from the night before. So I had to basically raise $84,000 in less than two days because it was very time, time sensitive. So... Uh, my wife ended up, she, I posted on Facebook. I'm like, does anybody want to go splits on this package? And my wife saw it before I saw her and she's like, you bought the package, didn't you? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I bought it. So, um, so I she says it like she knows you and that's normal. Oh, she knew. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah, she definitely. Yeah. And she's, she's like, you do interviews about this sometimes. You, you never bring it up. I'm like, so I brought it up on this show, but, um, so yeah, I had to raise $84,000 in two days, um, and never reached out to People, I've never raised money before in the past. Like I had a very successful business that was right. all on the backs of credit cards and stuff like that. I was raised that you never ask anything from anybody, um, even if you're dying of thirst, like you don't ask for water type thing. So I had that lim those limiting beliefs there. And I'm like, I, I had to overcome because yeah. my back was against the wall. So again, another example of really stretching myself to find $84,000 and following through with it. And I ended up calling three people. The first two people said they'd lend me the money right out of the gate. Um, so that's how I got the that's money great. for, for mastermind talks. Yeah. yeah. So then obviously you have this idea, but then <laughs> execution is another story. Tell me about some of the challenges with the first event. Uh, fears again, fear of being judged. I mean, I procrastinate. I, I knew I was going to do an event in November. I like, I bought his books, November, 2012. Uh, I procrastinated on the whole event planning thing till like January. And when we originally were originally bought the books from him, he's like, well, let's, let's set our first date. So I'm like, I'll do it May 23rd, 24th. And the reason why I did it May 23rd, 24th is because my birthday is on May 28th. And historically, my birthday has always been the most depressing day of the year for me. Really? Uh, because I always feel like I haven't accomplished enough. I always hold myself to like other, like, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's birthday is like a week before mine. So I'm like, well, this guy's 29. He's worth $100 billion. Like, I feel like such a chump, right? So I usually have like really kind of negative thoughts during my birthday, but I've got over that, but I've gotten over that, but that was my model for like 10 plus years. Yeah. So I'm like, if I do an event a week before my birthday and it's a success, maybe I'll feel better on my birthday. So I uh, ended up uh, picking the event. And then one great kind of takeaway in, in that kind of process uh, was listen to feedback, act on behavior. And what I mean by that is I asked a lot of people in the event space, you know, how much could I charge for an event like this? And everybody said, you can't get more than a thousand bucks. So I'm like, all right, you guys are the experts. So I'll charge nine ninety five. So I charged nine ninety five. We started selling tickets at nine ninety five, And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to throw a price out there. I'm going to do a quick like AB test. I'm not super like split tester guy, but I'm like, I'm going to send a hundred people to a different landing page and see if people buy at 3,397. And we had just as many people buy at 3,397. Wow. Uh, and the, but the best part was is that the actual quality of people were better because I wanted a very certain type of individual at this event. And, uh, I wasn't like I had to refund quite a few people because they buy a ticket. I hold a phone call with them. Everybody who so from the first it, event, you still curate it. The you you curated the first event also. Oh, it was incredibly curated. Yeah, oh. I even say even more so than the second event because the second event. 
So the first event, we have 4,200 people apply. Yeah. And I went through every single application one by one. Wow. If I thought somebody was a good fit, I'd send them an invite. When they bought a ticket, I'd hold a phone call with them. And if they weren't the right fit, I'd refund their money. So the first event, I refunded $43,000 in paid tickets, um, which was no easy task. No, I not at turning, all. Turning people away. But yeah. I didn't know if that high level curation would pay off. Because I, again, just to, you know, for context, I was a quarter million dollars in debt at the time. So to turn away, basically the money hits your bank account and to be like, no, I don't want your money is bananas. So, but I ended up doing it and I didn't know if it pay off and it did. Our first event was a huge hit. So I'm like, I'm on to something. Our second event, we didn't open it up to the general public. Instead, I just reached out to uh, 90 entrepreneurs who I thought would be a good fit and 78% of those people signed up. So that virtually filled up the majority of that event plus the yeah. people who attended last year. We only allow a third to come back, the top third uh, year over year. So that third plus the the people that I invited. So that filled up our second event. So we're working on our third event now. Uh, but uh, yeah, the uh, highly, highly curated audience because the quality of the event really lays on the quality of the people in the room. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's the ultimate, the ultimate safety net. If you have the right people in the room, uh, you can literally lock the doors for two days and they'll get tremendous value from that. Yeah. Uh, and the speakers are there just really to kind of set the tone of like, you know, they're there to draw an audience in the room. And thankfully, we have enough brand equity now that people don't necessarily care who's on stage because our speakers who win our events are not the big big name speakers. That's the beautiful thing about our events yeah. is we don't, we don't pay our speakers. We, we put up a prize for the best talk as voted by the audience. So... Our first event, our first place winner, second place winner, and our four people tied for third, none of them were the big names. Hmm. None of them were the draws so who for the were event. The, who were the, those top three for the first event? Yeah, so Joey Coleman. Uh, he did a creative live after Mastermind Talks. One of my best friends now and absolutely one of the best speakers I've ever seen. He's given over 4,000 talks. And now he's starting. He's going to get into the limelight soon, but an incredible presenter. Uh, a guy named Sully Brakes who's a uh, spoken yes, word artist yes, on YouTube. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I took a chance on having him at the event and he's never, he was incredibly nervous and he was, he's never spoken really? into, to an audience like that. Yeah. But he killed it. He got second place. He did phenomenal. Uh, in third place, we have my buddy Jim Shields who talks about board meetings, which is a, a philosophy, basically a retreat for entrepreneurs and their children, which is phenomenal. Uh, who else do we have? Another guy named Dan Dapani who's a monk, a modern day monk. He was a monk for 12 years and now does a lot of like workshops and stuff like that around mindfulness for, for entrepreneurs. Uh, James Altucher and Dan Martell. Those, those were the other two. So what were some of the big challenges, mistakes around the first event? Because at this point, it seems like everything's running smooth. You made this big bet and it all worked out, but what happened behind the scenes? Were there any big challenges? We always try to romanticize about the past. I can't, looking back, I can't see that many challenges. I mean, I can see ch there was challenges. I mean, I had no money. Like the reason I had to, uh, the reason I had to do a speaker prize and be creative was because I had no money to pay the speakers. So it worked out in my favor. It was an mm -hmm. advantage later on. But at the time, it was a huge disadvantage to not have any money and you're trying to put on this world-class event. Mm -hmm. um, but in hindsight, I mean, everything, you know, when you look at the event itself, everything was done exceptionally well. Um, and this is not kind of patting myself on the back. Like, I, you know, as an, when you do anything, you want everything to go flawlessly. And with that event, everything went flawlessly. Really? And because of that, um, it was scary for me the second time around because I felt like I had more to prove at right. our second event than I did at our first event. Because I'm like, yeah. now everybody has these heightened expectations. Right. So to, I felt like people had low expectations going into our first event as to what to expect from an event. So now they're coming in with these heightened expectations. So our second event, it's going to be hard for us to raise that again. Mm -hmm. So we had to do some stuff you know, at our second event that um, – you know, really kind of pull out all the stops to a degree. And so I felt even more pressure for our second event than I did for our first event to, to an extent. I mean, the one reason why I guess I felt a lot of pressure on our first event is because I'm not a comfortable public speaker by any stretch. And Mastermind Talks, I was the biggest audience I ever spoken in front of. And it was an audience of people who were all more successful than me and who are like my heroes, like Mark Echo in the room, Tim Ferriss in the room, Ryan Holiday in the room, like, you, they're listening to this like you know former chubby kid on stage right so that's what's going uh, on in your head anyways pretty much yeah, yeah. so it was uh so how do you get over that i mean because you could have just got a moderator just to moderate so it's funny so you it's funny you bring that up because i was going to and a good friend of mine named michael fishman 
uh, brought it up to me. He's like, you know, you're you're really what you're going with for this event is like authenticity and integrity and stuff like that. And he's like, if you have somebody who's an MC who's really polished, it takes away, it, it just won't jive with the vibe of the event, right? Uh, as opposed to like somebody like me, I'm I'm kind of like you know I'll fumble a little bit and that kind of stuff, and it it actually helps people feel comfortable, right? If I right. kind of make a fool of myself on stage, and I actually we had two Q and A's, one with Mark Echo, one with Tim Ferriss, and I flew in Mitch Joel uh, to actually do those interviews because I didn't feel competent enough to do it. And that Mastermind Talks, our last event, I did all the interviews. I was on stage more than I was the first time and that kind of stuff. So um, definitely could have hired an MC. But uh, yeah. thankfully, I got that great advice from a friend of mine and decided to swallow hard and do it myself. And thankfully, I mean, that, that's been a game changer. Because if I had an MC, it would, this would be very, very different for me right now. Right, yeah. I mean, what's your tactic for doing it? Do you mention to the audience this? I've never really spoken on, on stage before. What's your way of kind of getting over it, but yeah, kind of letting know the audience know? Well, I guess one of the biggest things I probably did get from Tony Robbins, looping back to it, is you know he has this this quote or this saying that seven seconds of courage can change your life and for me like i i the the analogy i always bring back to this is actually when i was skydiving like it was uncomfortable to be going up in the plane and that kind of stuff I, thinking about it makes me uncomfortable yeah it's a, yeah i mean it's a dingy plane you like you could you know it could crash but then you have a parachute so you have a bit of a chance <laughs> but when they fling open that door you only have to have you only have to be courageous for like seven to ten seconds because after you're out there you're just you, you can't do anything, right? You, you, you're already in it and that kind of stuff. So right. same thing with Mastermind Talks. I remember I delayed the event like maybe 10 minutes because I was scared to get on stage. And finally I went on stage. Mm. Like finally I'm just like, I'm going to walk up there. And I did it. And listening to my talk and like I have the video of my talk, like I actually did a really good job. Um, you would never know watching your talk that you were nervous or that you've mm. not done this before. There's no, no, and I was I was kind of surprised myself because in in our heads we always think like sometimes I do a, a podcast recording for my podcast and I'm like that was terrible and I I get send it out there I get all all kinds of like positive feedback and then I'll listen to it again I'm like oh, it wasn't that bad you know what I mean so it uh, it was definitely like that and I'm very much a uh, I don't want to I hate to say like I'm a personable guy but I'm yeah. you know it, it's one of those you things were, yeah you have a warm smile very inviting people feel comfortable i think thank you yeah, yeah. so that that's that's basically that's what i want to get at so i uh you know i kind of i work with it and i'm not polished and nor do i intend to be anymore because i understand the the power of vulnerability and authenticity and stuff like that and, yeah. and people again that polished stuff you can get anywhere and yeah. that's the beauty of our event i mean we had three speakers at our first event in tears while they were giving their talks really um and like that's how raw and vulnerable their talks were, and that wasn't necessarily planned. I knew the the room had to be vulnerable on some level for people to connect on a genuine level. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean that, that that rawness is what you don't get everywhere else. So what you get everywhere else is superficial business talk of like, what do you do? You know, how big's your business? How many employees do you have? And that that's you know that's you don't build deep relationships at that level by any stretch. So mm -hmm. we try to cut through that as quick as possible and get right to, you know, what matters to you? Like, what do you stand for? Like those kind of things, right? Like, you know, the question about the parenting, like I said, I mean, that that's the most passionate thread in our closed Facebook group right now. Yeah. And uh, that's what really people care about. They don't care about marketing tactics and, and stuff like that. Like, why are they trying to grow their business? It's because they want to take care of their kids, right? They, they right. want to take care of what's important. Um, so, you know, we have a saying that an entrepreneur is somebody who goes from working in their business to on their business, but there's a second tier of entrepreneur that goes from working on their business to working on themselves. And those are the type of people we put in the room. And those are the type of people I love to serve. Yeah. So Jason, I see how you got Tim Ferriss, but you mm -hmm. attracted just elite top level entrepreneurs without buying $84,000 worth of books. Yeah. How did you do that? What were some of the, what was, there's gotta be some good stories behind yeah, those. well, I mean, that's that's uh, you know, I guess that's kind of a secret sauce. A secret sauce that I don't mind sharing. Um, and how it basically was is I knew if I got Tim, I could get people who wanted to be connected to Tim, or people who are already connected with Tim, but they're never at the same place at the same time. So we all have a yearning to be connected, like the attendees have a yearning to be connected, and the speakers as well. 
right? I mean, they're normally they fly in for an event, do a talk, fly out. That's the kind of standard practice. And I knew if I really created this kind of experiential environment, like we did a cooking class with the speakers the day before the event. I thought that was best practice. All the speakers were like, we never do this kind of stuff. Maybe we'll do a dinner after the event. I'm like, that's ridiculous. Why would you put it at the end of the event? But that's kind of standard practice. And like I say all the time, conventional methods yield conventional results and right. ignorance and confidence can go a long way. So I just didn't know better. So that's how I kind of set things up. So I really positioned the event to be this catalyst to reconnect a bunch of people who already knew each other um, and also to kind of infuse all the few, a few other people who want to be part of that yeah. community to a degree. So that was kind of the secret sauce behind it. So who is on your short list to, like, who did you want to have speak? For our first event? Yeah. Uh, that, we, that we weren't able to get? No, either one. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm trying to, yeah, I mean, for our first, oh God, it's going to be a mishmash because I'm thinking of our two events. But uh, yeah, so, I mean, first we'll of all. talk about we, the second one, too. Yeah, so, I mean, well, we've had, you know, we had Guy Kawasaki, we had obviously Tim Ferriss, Mark Echo, um, for the information marketers out there. We had Derek Halper and Lewis Howes, uh, Ben Greenfield, Ryan Holiday, James Altucher, um, you know, some lesser knowns like Joey Coleman, who won the event, like Sully Brakes, Esther Perel, who's incredible what she does. Um, God, uh, Aubrey Marcus from On It, uh, Dave Asprey, we had at our last event. Um, the list goes on and on. Yeah. There's people in the audience. Cameron Harold was an attendee at, last, at, the, at our first event. He was not a speaker, he was an attendee. And then he spoke at our second event and he signed up for our third event. So, the, the beautiful thing about us is when you look at our second event, 10 of our 15 speakers who went to our first first event who spoke at our first event paid to be attendees at our second event wow. which is unheard of to a degree because this is what they do day in and day out and they usually no, never even like go to an event and stay the entire time right so for them to actually not only commit mm -hmm. to going to an event but paying is mm -hmm. a great testament to i guess the quality of the event yeah so what was a really memorable moment for you in one of the events um there's two uh, that really come to mind. One is the, at our first event, uh, it was, like I said, it was my birthday the following week and my <clears throat> wife ended up organizing a cake to be at the event. Um, and when I was doing kind of like closing speech on the second day, uh, they brought it out and I had all my mentors there kind of sing me happy birthday and stuff like that. So that's probably, uh, you know, one of the highlights <laughs> from a birthday perspective. But our second event, um, there was a guy named Jesse Elder who was one of our attendees and he, uh, walking out of the venue, there was a piano there and he ended up just hopping on the piano and started playing. And I was around the corner and I started hearing this like this chatter and I'm like, what, what's going on? And I go out and there's about 30, 40 people in a circle singing hallelujah. Um, just like just random randomly after the event and I'm like this is like it was an incredible feeling because it, it had that kind of sense of community and I'm like this is what mastermind talks is all about like this serendipity like these close relationships and there's other cool things like you know Dave Asprey's a quirky guy and he had like this some kind of electrolysis machine that he brought to like we had a we partnered with a five-star hotel in Toronto so everybody went to the bar afterwards and he came with his electrolysis machine and like hooked people up to it and stuff like that like these weird quirky guys so there's a ton of stuff but for me the highlight out of both events was actually people just randomly singing in the hallway together after the event, like not like wasn't planned, just happened on its own. And it was just to me, it was a great testament of uh, just the community. Yeah. So uh, when I reached out to Jason Weisenthal, because he's heard you speak, we, and we I'm have like, to give him credit. We have yeah, to give I have him to give him credit. credit. You know, Jason Weisenthal, founder of Wall Monkeys, he's a raving fan of you, the event, and so I. I didn't want this to make be like every other podcast that covers all the same questions. Sure. So I asked him. So he has two questions for you, <laughs> which I wanted to mention and, and ask. So he, he wanted to ask about your podcast. He said it's very time consuming. He's choosing to do it for some reason when his time is so valuable. And he wants to know what your thoughts are behind doing the podcast. And do you have plans to monetize it? With my podcast? Yeah. And for people who don't know, just mention your podcast. They can check it out for sure. Yeah, so I have a podcast called mmtpodcast.com. Mm -hmm. So you can find out all the information there. But for me, the biggest thing is that uh, several things. One is that um, – I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing this answer because I get that question too. So I'm going to – Sure. Yeah. Well, my main 
driver for it is that I've tried blogging, I've tried YouTube channel, like I've had friends who have been rock stars in all these channels, and I never found something that worked for me. Mm -hmm. And for me, podcasting for some reason works. Um, and I launched a podcast in January, it was very successful. I wasn't expecting it to be successful, but it was. It was taken down by iTunes uh, five weeks later for some BS copyright issue. So I had to restart. But the reason why I started the podcast to begin with is one of my biggest motivators is if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, I'm leaving nothing behind. I'm leaving nothing behind from a content perspective for my daughter, for for anybody. And I do a lot of great work, quote unquote, in the mastermind talks environment. So in that intimate environment of 130, 150 people who are all like real players and stuff like that. So it's really rewarding to help these people who are already, you know, going a thousand miles an hour, get them to where they want to go faster. Um, but there's a lot of people out there who I can also help through, you know, doing something like just scaling through the, the podcast. Like the beautiful thing about this is that you and I could have a conversation right now over the phone, this exact same conversation, but instead, and it would just be, you know, between you and I, instead, you're going to put this on a podcast episode and it's going to reach thousands of people. I mean, that's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful age to live in. Mm -hmm. So for me, I, one of my fears was that if I got hit by a bus, I wouldn't leave anything behind. Also forces me to kind of create content and start it, like to me, one of the best ways to be quote unquote aware is actually sit down and write. Um, and uh, this forces me on a regular basis because I do a lot of solo episodes. I don't really do interviews. Yeah. How so did forces you decide to choose the format? Um, well, one of the core reasons. Because I listened I, to your Jordan interview and in the very beginning you said, I don't usually do interviews. I usually am just doing it solo. That was, yeah, that was my favorite interview. Yeah, um, yeah I, that, it, well, the, one of the core reasons for that is because um, there, I mean, there, it's, there's a lot of noise, you know, with, I don't want to take a stab at him, but John Lee Dumas and his model of doing daily interview podcasts, and he teaches other people how to do podcasts who have adopted his model. So there's so much noise in the podcasting space, everybody's doing the same thing and everybody interviewing the same people. You're actually different, mm -hmm. right? And I know there's a lot of close friends of mine who are not big names or not in the spotlight, but who are like really amazing people, amazing stories and stuff like that, who you interview. And that's why, like I said, out of all the podcast interviews I've been on 20 plus now yours is always what i've always wanted oh, to wow. be on thank you um so that for me there was a lot of people doing interviews um and it's it's one thing to be like highly rated podcast when you have a, a seth godin and a tim ferris and you're just leveraging their names it's another thing to have a highly rated podcast where it's all your own content um to yeah. a degree so i think it's tougher that's why i ask you know oh, it's brutal it's funny because i just did another interview so i the model for our podcast is going to be a third of it's going to be interviews a third of, of it's going to be solo stuff and a third of it's going to be repurposed talks for mastermind talks mm -hmm. and i just did an interview with uh my buddy tucker max a few days ago and i cut it up and i literally did it in like half an hour and i'm like this is why people do interviews it's so much easier like you actually you're different in the sense that you do a ton of research i was blown away at the research you did on me you and andrew warner uh, as far as like your your the, well, the i love andrew yeah. yeah yeah i mean as far as the research you guys do on people in advance it was it's absolutely ridiculous right a lot of people don't do that level of research. I mean, I've been on, on multiple podcasts and oftentimes they hit record and they're like, okay, well tell me your story. You're like, I've told this story 40 times. I don't even want to say it again. <laughs> right. So, so that's why I appreciate you taking it yeah. in a different direction. And you're one of the, the few that is, is exempt from the rule, but there's a lot of Thank noise you. in that kind of interview space. So that's, uh, that's why I started it. And that's yeah. why I so, kind of shy away from interviews. So in his question, do you have plans to monetize it? Um, I'm not too quick on monetize. I'm definitely in a position where I have to start, you know, I, I need to focus on money. Now that I'm on top of the numbers, I know like what I need to do in order to kind of pull myself out of this and put my, uh, move myself out of survival mode to a degree because I'm still not out of it. Um, but I'm not in a, in, a, in a super duper rush. I mean, for me, I'm not going to have, we didn't have sponsors for the first two Mastermind Talks events, which is bananas because for an event like that, you can easily pull in some big name sponsors. But oftentimes sponsors want to speak from the stage, which you know compromises the integrity right. of the environment and stuff like that. And that's something I'll never compromise. So right. same thing with a podcast. I won't bring on sponsors necessarily if they're going to like, if they're not in alignment with the brand sure. or they're going to yeah, be. Yeah, I thought Charity not, Water was, a, I mean, Charity Water was a sponsor of the second event. And yeah, well, we, we partnered with them because yeah. some of the speakers were going to support them if, uh, right. if, um, yeah, if, if they won the speaker competition, stuff like that. So mm -hmm. we're very, very conscious as to who we partner with. And as far as the podcast is concerned, uh, for me, and there's two ways people can pay, right? They can pay with like cash and purchase something or they can pay with attention. 
And, you know, attention is, Gary Vee says it all the time, you know, attention is new currency. So just to get people to listen and to commit for an hour mm -hmm. is huge. Mm -hmm. um, so that level in, of engagement, I mean, you think McDonald's, how much they spend on marketing for get, to get somebody to see an ad for a blip of a second. So to get somebody to commit for an hour, I'll give them everything I have and I'll figure out later should I need to monetize, but I can find other ways to make money. Yeah. I mean, he was just, I think, saying your time is so valuable. You know, what would you do to monetize it if you were to do it? Uh, so the podcast? Yeah. I would start, uh, I would start a, probably an online community in a sense where I do, because I've thought about it. And uh, like I said, there's, there's, I do have an audience, a small audience, but I do have an audience of people. It's a who curated, high-level audience. Well, yeah. I have, I have that audience, but I have an mm. audience that I'll never be able to serve. The people who can't afford mastermind talks, the people who will never make it into a mastermind talks, or maybe one day, but you know, in the next coming years, they're just they're starting business or that kind of stuff. So there's a mm. huge part of my audience that. I'll never be able to serve. So if I start something like a membership uh, site of sorts where I do like a master class and like group coaching calls and those kind of things, so there's definitely uh, – that's a great way for me to deliver massive value in scale mm -hmm. um, and I'm able to monetize it that way. I think that's probably the the best model uh, for me. But it's uh, – yeah, it's one of those things. It's not necessarily – whatever kind of comes natural. I mean I'm, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about doing like books and stuff like that as well. Um, I mean, I'm all about delivering value, so it it mm -hmm. like it sucks to me that there's a part of my audience that's not getting value because they're not coming to Mastermind Talks events. So how can I deliver value to them? Mm -hmm. It's it's through the podcast right now. Yeah, yeah. And I think anyone needs to follow you because it seems like when everyone's zigging, you're zagging. You know, <laughs> I mean, in a good way because when and one thing, if you go to MastermindTalks.com, um, and actually. I'm not sure. I think that's the site where basically you can't just join your mailing list, right? You actually curate your your mailing list. What we do so your email you, list. You you can well no. So one thing I, I did do. People don't know this on the outside. I brought it up actually in one podcast episode where because we hit number one in iTunes. People are like, "How'd you hit number yes. one?" And I, and I go through the numbers, and it's not that impressive when you actually break down the numbers, but. One thing we do is our mailing list is about 6,000 people right now, and I've had my assistant go through everybody one by one, and if they give us an email address where they haven't opened up any of our emails or it's not associated to a Twitter account or a Facebook account let's say, or something like that, we delete them. Mm -hmm. uh, because again, I want like a, an engaged audience. One of the best things I do uh, for our podcast, which has been phenomenal for us, is I actually don't care that much about an email list because at the end of the day, I know info marketers are like, email list is everything. To me, it's still a broadcast, right? It's not a two-way conversation. It's not a discussion. Um, it's a great way to broadcast information, but you're not creating community from it. So what we have is something called the MMT community where all my short resources go there and all that kind of stuff. Right. And basically, people go in through an email opt-in, but it goes right to a Facebook, a private curated Facebook group. Right. And that has been great. Um, and I love that because I'm able to kind of see people, you yeah, know. Very smart. You know, yeah, yeah and, and talk to them and converse. And I'd rather have a mailing list of 250 people who I know. And I know where, you know, that's what, even Mastermind Talks. Why we, The only reason why we only have 130, 150 people is because I want to know everybody on a personal level. I want to know who their ideal customer is, where they are, where they want to go. Like I want to have that level of mm -hmm. kind of interaction with them because it's it's all for me it's all about quantity over or sorry quality over quantity. Mm -hmm. And so the other question he had, Jason, was: Do you have any great ideas for a new business or any plan on and any plan on doing it, or are you just there's no time you're just focused on mastermind? So Talks. I have hundreds of new ideas, and thankfully I have people who keep me in check <laughs> so that I focus on the things that matter. Because you know, right. truth be told, I mean, I, I struggle with this all the time. I'd love to go and become an author and do books and that kind of mm -hmm. stuff and, and all that kind of, but, or even do the membership site. But you look at the, the numbers, and this is what I always have to kind of come back to, is you know, right now is that like if I do a, a book, you know, I, I, maybe I'll do 2500 bucks a month or something like that. Uh, but all the work that goes involved to doing something like that versus I sell one ticket for Mastermind Talks, that's $5,000, mm -hmm. right? So it just, right now, as far as where my bandwidth is allocated, it's better allocated towards Mastermind Talks. And for me, now that I know Mastermind Talks has legs and it truly lights me up, increasing the experience year over year is a huge drop. Like I think of the, our, our, our event as of right now is 238 days away. And I think about, day in day out the experience but who's counting like, yeah 
well, the experience that somebody has when they buy a ticket, what's the first interaction they have with us? When they walk mm -hmm. into the, the venue, what's, who are they meeting? What's, you know, what does it look like? How do they feel? Mm -hmm. What are their stated goals? What are their unstated goals? I go through that process all the time. And yeah. if I had other things on my plate, I couldn't do mastermind talks as well as we do yeah. it. And I want to become like a world-class facilitator of experiences, whether it be events or podcasts or whatever the case may be. So it's uh, it's one of those things. A lot of us spread ourselves too thin. And as entrepreneurs, it's it's easy to get, you know, sidetracked by shiny red objects. For so, sure. um, so yeah, no, definitely a lot of business ideas. So what's a good business idea that you can give away that you think someone should do, but you don't have the bandwidth to do it? I think some of the best potential businesses – uh, in the service space, space is by looking at the top rated um, activities on TripAdvisor. That's something I came up with recently because I do, for example, we do axe throwing in Toronto. I, I did a, an axe event. Throwing? Yeah, so there's a place called Battle Axes in Toronto, which is literally, it's this league and they have these boards and you throw axes at these boards. And it's one of the highest rated uh, activities on TripAdvisor in Toronto. And I did an entrepreneur uh, thing. Um, I did an entrepreneur meetup there about uh, last week or two weeks ago with 20 entrepreneurs. They all loved it. I've brought speakers there for mastermind talks, axe throwing. They all loved it. Um, and it's one of those kind of top rated things on TripAdvisor. Another top rated thing on TripAdvisor locally is uh, adventure rooms, like those escape rooms where it's like a puzzle in order to get out. I have never uh, seen those. Those are – they're blowing up like mad. So it's easy. Like you never find – as far as activities on TripAdvisor, you never find uh, like common stuff per se. Like you'll see museums and stuff like that, but there'll always be that one or two things that that are kind of these emerging kind of mm -hmm. trends that are really picking up steam that have evangelists. Uh, it's a great way because I'm like I would do an adventure room or I'd do axe throwing. The, uh, yeah, like either of those are like pretty great businesses. Um, so as far as coming up with business ideas, um, TripAdvisor, oddly enough, because I thought about it recently, I'm like this is a great kind of tool to kind of pick up business ideas. Yeah, get your creative juices flowing. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. So, Jason, you talked a lot about colleagues, mentors. Who are some of your mentors and some of the best advice they've given you? So, yeah. So, I that I mean, that's a tough one in the sense because um, I, I – You have well, so, so many. Yeah. Well, so there, there's – the thing with mentors is people – when they think of mentorship, they think of, you know, I have to meet with somebody on a monthly basis. They have to be local and that kind of stuff. And I think we live in such a beautiful world where you don't – like you can have multiple mentors and you don't have to have face-to-face -face interaction with mentors to, to a degree. So, for example, I mean Ryan Holiday is a friend of mine. I think the guy's a total genius and he writes pretty regularly, has blog posts all the time. So what I do is I'll actually pick one person – to focus all my energy on for like a month or two months and just hmm. dig into everything they've ever written uh, and just go deep. And that to me is a form of men yeah. like a mentorship. Yeah. Uh, I do have my own mentors now uh, that hold me accountable in certain areas and stuff like that and they've always been fantastic. But I think the, the big misconception is that you need to have somebody physically right. and that and that the major benefit with that oftentimes is accountability more than anything. Um, but with that said, however, a lot of people make the mistake and they don't ask. Um, there's a lot of people I know who are incredibly successful in business, have a lot to give, and the topic of mentorship will come up and they'll be like, nobody's ever asked me. And I'm like, are you serious? Like you have a $100 million business, nobody's ever asked you to be you know, be mentored by them or be a mentee of yours? And they're like, no. So there's a this huge kind of misconception that you know, there's, if, if they're a big name, they've, always, they've been reached out to or they'll say no, that kind of stuff, and that's often not the case. Yeah. Uh, as far as the best advice is concerned, I think the best advice I, I get on a regular basis is, is again, through uh, going deep with, with people like a Ryan Holiday, like a Seth Godin, that kind of stuff. And just um, Ryan, Ryan actually came up with this philosophy called the commonplace book. And I, I, I've always done something like that. But basically, it's whenever you get a nugget of wisdom, you save it. So he writes it on like cue cards. I do it with an Evernote. But I have a list of just like nuggets of wisdom mm. that I use for all kinds of stuff that I've collected over the past like yeah. four or five years. Um, so I guess one of the biggest, yeah, from best advice is concerned. I mean, I got a, I got a ton from that. Yeah. But um, well, that brings me to the next one, which is your best advice. So what are some of the nuggets? That you uh, can share? Sure. Well, I mean, to me, again, something that comes up in my story, story time and time again is the the power of relationships, right? And you never know the value of your network until you really need it. And that's one thing I started investing in long before I needed. And I see a lot of entrepreneurs make the mistake where, again, they, they're trying to peg an ROI to being friends with somebody. And they don't reach out to somebody until they need to 
they need something from them to a degree, right? So it's like, hey, you know, so and so, best selling author, um, how you doing? I love your work. And they're like, they reply back and you're like, oh, by the way, can you do this for me or something like that? Or can you point me in the right direction? So I'm always much more kind of firm believer of like, you have to plant those seeds far in advance. And you never know if you'll need them. You may never need them. I have people mm -hmm. in my network I've been friends with for four, three, four years. I've never asked anything from them. Uh, I don't know if I ever will, but it's just, it's one of those things. So I've always been kind of, focused on my network and there's there's a saying I have that you know when you're you hit rock bottom you'll be left with two things one is your word and the integrity around your word and the second thing is your network and you should never tarnish your word and you should always invest in your network and those are kind of two things I really live by because if you look at my that $84,000 I raised it was a crazy investment to make. I was in survival mode. I was a quarter million dollars in cash debt. I had a business idea that was only a few hours old. And when I reached back to the guy who gave me gave me the money, I'm like, "Why did you give give me $84,000, like it's crazy in hindsight. He's like, I wasn't investing in the business, I was investing in you. And that's when it really kind of became clear to me the importance of integrity. Mm -hmm. uh, and I try to hold myself to a high level of integrity whenever possible. Yeah. So where do you think you got that from? From your parents or? Uh, oh. I mean, I haven't always been like that. I mean, my parents, I guess, hold them, they're, <laughs> they're okay in the integrity department, I guess. But uh, I think it's just through through learning, you know, I just uh, the personal uh, personal development and awareness and stuff like that. I, I think that's really what it comes down to. Like, I I don't want to, you know, position myself as like I'm incredibly aware, but I definitely question myself and question my actions. Do you do that for long enough, for an, enough years? You question yourself five, ten times a day. Eventually, you get to know who you really are, yeah. uh, and you get to cut away at, at the stuff mm -hmm. that you know. It's just the, the, those filters other people see you through, and you just become real. And that's one mm -hmm. thing why I'm able to kind of build relationships quickly is because, mm -hmm. you know, I am relatively raw and honest, and there's not too much to me. I'm pretty simple. And when I connect with people who are the same, we connect. Like I can connect with somebody in five minutes, and I know they'll be in my life for the rest of my life. Right. Like they will always be there. Yeah. So. Um, that's really kind of what it is. So I guess it's that personal development kind of awareness type thing, which would, that's how I got on that path of integrity. I thought you were going to say my wife whipped me in a shape. But. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, Jason, I really appreciate your time. And um, I have one last question. Yeah, please, man. Um, actually, let me ask you a question before. I want you to talk about what you're working on now, point people to the, the site, but I, I have to ask this one because Jason did mention this too in Vegas. You have some interesting daily rituals. So, I do. Yeah. So what do you do from 4 a.m. to like 8 a.m.? Well, I don't wake up at 4 a.m. anymore. Oh, okay. uh, but I'm starting to. Uh, so I woke up at 4 a.m. for a year. Um, and the reason that I stumbled across uh, morning rituals just by chance. And the reason for that was because when I was quarter million dollars in debt, I was unhappy. And uh, I was resenting my daughter. At the time, she was six months old. Six months old, and I'm like, "This You're is crazy." Deprived. Well, I'm like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm like, it's well, you know, since you've had two kids, but you know, it's it's crazy for for to to think that you'd actually resent something so small. You know what I mean? Like it's it, it's a crazy thought. So I'm like, I'm unhappy. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do research on to see like you know what is the foundation of what are the pillars of happiness? What's the, how do you be, move from being unhappy to happy right. and that kind of stuff? And one of the key pillars to happiness is perceived control. And I'm very clear as to perceived why. Perceived control. Perce yeah, perceived control. So I'm very clear as to why I'm an entrepreneur. So I can do what I want, when I want, wherever I want. And when you have a kid, they throw all that out the window. And that's the life I led for quite some time. I had that freedom. Mm. So I lost all sense of control. Uh, and I was definitely in transition. And there's a saying that, you know, when one door closes, another one opens. But it sucks being stuck in the hallway. So I was just didn't know where I was going. I was not happy. But I, so I thought to myself, I kind of sat down with myself. I'm like, listen, I can bank on not having control between the hours of 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., which is when my daughter's awake. But what I can control is the time before that or the time after that. And because I'm naturally kind of like an early riser, I was waking up maybe like 6 or 6.30 at the time. Mm. I'm like, I'm just going to start controlling, being vigilant as far as how I control the first few hours of my day. So I start waking up at 4 a.m. And uh, just I, I, it changed my life because for the first four hours, I just became so incredibly productive that 
by the time my daughter woke up, my rest of my day could go to hell. I already did the bulk of my work. I already did the important work. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a true game changer for me. And and now, I mean, morning rituals is a huge thing. They've changed over the over the years. Uh, I do you know cold baths and cold showers. Yeah, I saw that. Rituals. Someone ch- I think challenged you, and you're like, I take an ice bath every day. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, it was, what the, are you gonna get it was the ice bucket challenge. And I'm like, yeah. dude, I think ice baths were like, you know, 30 minutes, three times a week. So, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so I mean, morning rituals has been absolutely enormous mm-hmm. for me. So, yeah. So what were some of the other things that allowed you to go from, that you saw that people went from unhappy to happy? Um, that was that was the one that resonated the most with me. I mean, there, there's a few others. I mean, I yeah. know com- relationships, community okay. is a big thing. We're we're definitely social beings, right? So mm-hmm. that's a big thing. Um, but perceived control to me was the biggest thing because again, mm-hmm. that was my that was my backbone for being. That's um, a lot of entrepreneurs are in business because they're, they're what they're moving towards is it's not necessarily you know finances or a number. What they're moving, they're trying to move towards is freedom. Yeah. Uh, um, freedom to do whatever they want, but also yeah. freedom from the business so that they yeah. can actually do those things. So yeah. I had that at one point in time in my life. And when that all went away, I was like, dude, I'm, I have no reason to live right now. Like I'm not in a good position. So yeah. uh, perceived control when I read that, and that's one of like the fundamental pillars of happiness. Um, yeah. And that was a game changer for me. So that was my area of focus. Yeah. Yeah. So as you keep talking, I keep thinking of questions. So I, I'm going to just... <laughs> I'm we can just, do it wrong too. I don't know if you ever bring people back on the show, but I'm more than willing to. I'm just that. gonna say, tell people where to find you. I have one last question. Tell people where to find you. What are you working on lately? Uh, I, you know, what? the funny thing is, so we're again, we're 243 days out to Mastermind Talks, I believe it is. Um, I've never had this much time to plan an event. Um, I usually plan. I've usually planned our events. I procrastinate all the way up until about three, four months in advance, and then I go gung ho. This one, I'm trying my best to start focusing on it. So I've been. We already have our venue picked out in Napa. We're bringing on partners for the first time. We're really excited about that. Um, so, like I said, I'm getting very clear um, that I, I want to become well known for putting on a world-class event. It's not from an ego perspective. It's from like knowing that I can, this is, this is what I was meant for. And it's not necessarily just events, but creating community. Cause that's what people come, like we, people go to events for content, but what we, we bring them in for content. We sell them what they want, but we give them what they need. And they come in for content and what we give them at the event is connection. And what they leave with is community. Yeah. And that's where people do want that though. Or content or community community. Yo, it's all about community. Sorry yeah. if I, I said it wrong. but No, yeah, you me, said it right, but I'm just saying I think they need and want both, I, I think. Sure. Well, content's abundant, right? So you you want to hit, hear Tim Ferriss' talk from Mastermind Talks, just go on YouTube and you'll find mm-hmm. eight other versions of the exact same talk, right? So we live in a beautiful time where you can find content everywhere. We're inundated by uh, content, more content right. that we can do things with. So at the end of the day, for me, I'm a firm believer that all problems can be solved with the right network. Yeah. And there's not a single time I haven't posted something to Facebook and gotten the connection I needed or gotten the answer I needed mm-hmm. or those kind of things. So, uh, you know, to me, the trump card is having a good network and having a great community over any kind of content. Mm-hmm. So where can people find it? Where should they go? So if you go to the probably the best website is mmtpodcast.com. Uh, so mmtpodcast.com. That is there's going to be a link there to Mastermind Talks. That's where I do my own kind of uh, personal ramblings from time to time. So mm-hmm. I talk about sabotage in one of the episodes. I talk about morning rituals in another. So um, they, there's yeah there. And if you're interested in Mastermind Talks, it's mastermindtalks.com. What do you want me to put below your face as you're talking? What which one uh, should I put? greatest that ever lived uh, <laughs> i um i don't know oh, as far as like the for title? the domain sure should I oh, put mmt yeah. podcast or mastermind yeah, talks sure mmt podcast is, okay. is fine I, I mean i i talk about it's mmt podcast but it's mastermind talk so people can always google okay. mastermind talks if they're really interested yeah. in it so um do you have the speakers picked out for we, the next one so i just asked people okay. on our facebook i have group. a suggestion that's why i asked sure yeah good. swing it ted leonsis I think would be unbelievable. I saw him at one of Yannick's event, and yeah. he talks about happiness. Have you heard of him? Yeah. So he's the uh, is it Washington he's Capitals. The, yeah, owner of the Capitals. I think Groupon, the Wizards. Uh, he has a he's a stake in Groupon. Yes. Yeah. So um, 
he – I'm definitely probably going to try to reach out to him. It has a lot to do – there's a lot of factors. It's more of an art than a science. And last year we were considering over 125 speakers wow. for 13 spots. So this year we have a list of 150 thus far um, that we're going through and we'll have even fewer spots this time around. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of factors that, like location. The reason we're doing it in Napa is we're in close proximity to the big startups and stuff like that that we can leverage. You never know. I always throw – like every once in a while, I always throw these Hail Marys mm -hmm. to see if they land. You never know. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that may be a Hail Mary will yeah. I throw. So I, I definitely appreciate the suggestion. Yeah. Um, so my last question, Jason. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously this is Inspired Insider. So my question is a moment when you overcame a low point. What was that moment that you overcame a low point or huge challenge? And what did you do to push forward? Dude, that's my whole story. <laughs> I know. I know. I, <laughs> um. Yeah, I, I guess I, just one. Obviously, there were a lot of low points sure. along the way. A lot of highs. There was a lot of highs too in yes. hindsight. But uh, no, I mean, for me, again, the landing a quarter million dollars in cash debt was probably the lowest um, because my sense of fulfillment and meaning was tied to the business, and now I no longer had the business. So I was like, now what? It was just a really miserable time. And the importance of health, again, in the sense that and it, it sounds kind of cheesy, and people don't focus on it. But again, a lot of entrepreneurs build their businesses at the expense of their health, at the expense of the relationship with their, their spouse and that kind of stuff. And uh, I, yeah, for me, how I got out of that was morning rituals, the power of morning rituals. That was, to me, was a was a game changer because I couldn't control, as an entrepreneur, you can't control your industry, you can't control all that much, uh, but I could control my mornings. And having that control, just it, it, there's a ton of benefits to morning rituals. And uh, yeah, that was definitely what put my life back on track. Yeah, yeah I have to ask that. Not to sum up everything in three no, minutes, but yeah. I want to clip it at the end so that I just have a separate, a little separate post. And, sure. Do um, you want me to do it again? No, no, okay. no. Yeah. I was just, I'm just saying, you know, this is raw. I don't edit anything. Okay, so, uh, but I love your reaction. Like that was my whole story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, no, I, I couldn't think of it. So people I'm are going like... to have to watch the interview, but, you know, just some one thing that they can take action on at the end, which is do something with your morning ritual um, is huge. Yeah, to, to, to me, that was been one of the biggest things. And there's all mm -hmm. kinds of, you see blog posts of like, you know, what successful people do before you wake up and that kind of stuff. Like it, it's kind of, it's it's pretty common that a lot mm -hmm. of people wake up early. And it's not necessarily waking up early, but there's a, a certain portion of your day where you're not reacting to stimulus. That's the biggest problem is people wake up and the first mm -hmm. thing they grab is not their spouse. They grab their cell phone and they start opening Facebook and email and they start reacting. And it's, mm -hmm. it's a disaster from that point forward. Yeah. So. It's living with, it's working with intention and living with intention and having that time of day where you're really going to put out quality work. Yeah. Jason, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Dude, I, I hope you have me back one day. For sure. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Buddy.